If you've got your Bibles, of course you should have them. Go back to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And for those that are visiting us for the first time on Sunday mornings, we go through the Bible chapter by chapter. At the moment, we're going through the book of Luke and we're up to chapter number 5. So Luke 5, look at verse number 4. Luke 5 verse 4, the Bible reads, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draft. The title of the sermon this morning is Let Down Your Nets. Let Down Your Nets. Let's look at verse number 1. Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Now, this is a, there's a lot to cover again. Uh, the, the, the chapters in the book of Luke are pretty chunky, and I always try my best to go through the whole chapter if possible. So Luke chapter 5, verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Ge- uh, Ge- Ge- Gennesaret. All right? So what you're, first thing I want you to notice there, and I talked about this last week, okay? What should we be pressing upon the Lord? When we come to the house of the Lord, what is it that we're seeking to hear? You know, are we seeking to hear some music that's appealing to the flesh? You know, are we seeking to be entertained? Are we looking for the smoke machines and, and, the, and the purple spotlights? What is it that we're looking for when we come to the house of the Lord? Hey, what were the people wanting when they pressed upon Him? Hey, they were coming and they were thirsty to hear the Word of God is what they came for, okay? And so churches ought to be, and I'm not saying just our church, I'm saying all the churches that belong to the Lord Jesus Christ ought to be focused primarily first upon the Word of God. You start moving away from the Word of God, you start moving, losing direction. You start losing the will of God. You start moving away from the, from the example that the Lord Jesus Christ has left us with, okay? So we need to ensure that our church is always based upon the Word of God in season, out of season. Whether I like it, whether you like it is irrelevant. We need to preach the, the full counsel of God, okay? So look at verse number 2. And, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them, and we're washing their nets. Okay, so here we have the disciples. We have Peter and uh, um, and um, Andrew, I believe, as well. They're uh, washing their nets. These these shipping boats were empty, meaning that they had already spent the time, the day, out fishing, and they were wrapping things up. They were now just washing things, you know, packing up, you know. That and you'll see later on that they didn't catch anything. They had a pretty unsuccessful day out fishing. Look at verse number three. Speaking of Jesus, and he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, that's Peter, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So, of course, the people were pressing upon him, right? There was a, there was, there was a lot of people. Jesus found it better to just be go into the ship, be pushed out into the shore, and not have all those throngs of people around him. But he was able to preach there from the ship. Hey, look. Wherever it is, guys, you know, we have a nice pulpit now, but if all we had was a ship, hey, that's a, that's a good place to preach the Word of God, all right? It doesn't matter what you have available to you. Use what you have. Jesus, in this case, used the ship, pulled himself out, and preached the Word of the Lord. And, uh, and uh, verse number four, Now when he had left speaking, so once he finishes preaching, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep, and let down your nets for a draft. Okay, now that word draft, you might not be familiar with it. That word draft basically means to pull or to draw. When you let down your nets to, to go fishing, when you collect the fish, you're pulling or you're drawing upon that net, aren't you? That's the draft. That's what Jesus Christ is speaking about. And so when you understand what's going on here, it's a bit of an unusual request because the fishermen just spent all day fishing. They're already washing, they're already packing up and Jesus says, hey, let down your nets for the draft. Let them down because you're going to have a great catch and you're going to be able to catch a great number of fish is what Jesus is saying. But notice what he asks of Peter. What the title of the sermon is this morning is to let down your nets. Nets, plural, okay? More than one. All the nets that Peter had, all of them that he was washing, Jesus asked him, hey, let them all down, Okay? And of course, we see how Simon Peter answers. Verse number five. And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. So it's not just the day, it's also the night. They were, they were working the whole night. Surely these men were tired. 
Surely these men were sleepy. Surely these men were a little discouraged, right? And then he says, and have taken nothing. We've worked all night, Jesus. You know, we're tired and we've taken nothing. And now you're asking us to do it again? But then look what he says. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Wait a minute, Peter. How many nets did Jesus ask you to let down? The nets, plural, all the nets that you had. What does, how does Simon respond? Oh, let down the nets. All right. So we see that Simon Peter had a lack of faith here. You know, he did it in obedience to Christ. And sometimes we can do things in obedience to Christ, but we don't do it in the full capacity that Jesus Christ asks of us. All right. And we see this play out. And I love these stories in the Bible. You know, we see the failure of men. You know, that proves to me that I'm going to fail. I'm going to do something wrong. That proves to me that all of you are going to fail at some point when the Lord Jesus Christ asks of you, right? But we need to learn from the examples that we have in the Bible, okay? Now, um, obviously, we can say that uh, Peter was tired from uh, from a night of of fishing. And I just want to quote to you from Galatians 6, 9. You don't need to turn there. It says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Hey, Simon Peter was weary. He was tired, right? And Jesus Christ says, look, just keep the work. Keep going. And you know what? Doing the work of the Lord is weary. It gets tiring, okay? there There are moments where it's like, you know what? It'd be easy if I just don't serve the Lord today. It'd just be easier if I don't go soul winning today. Okay? It'd just be easier if I just don't do the commands that God has laid out in the Scriptures. Okay? Sometimes you might have that thought in your mind, but the Bible says, look, don't get weary in well-doing. Okay? We need to take time to refresh ourselves, and we'll soon see that even Jesus Christ had to take time to refresh Himself, to recharge His batteries, doing good works. All right? Just make sure when you get weary, you don't stop. Make sure when you get weary, you don't uh, forsake the work of God. All right? Take your break, yeah, but then get back onto it. Let down all your nets once again and start fishing again. Look at verse number 6, Luke 5, verse 6. And when they had done this, uh, when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishers. Look at the next thing. And their net, singular, and their net break. Why did that net break? Because Jesus Christ had blessed them with a great catch, right? What a great, (laughs) what a great blessing for these fishermen, right? At this point in time, it was their livelihood. At this time, there were great multitude there listening to Jesus Christ. I'm sure this great multitude wanted to eat as well, right? What a great blessing. But what happens? Could they sustain the blessing? Could they catch the blessing? No, their net broke. Because they disobeyed what God had asked of them. They were to let down all the nets. If he had let down all the nets, he wouldn't have this problem. He'd have sufficient nets to catch the fish on that day. All right? Now, this is what I want to talk about, guys, is that we need to let down all our nets. When Christ asks us to do something, don't doubt. Be in faith and do exactly what Christ asks of you, okay? Look, it is everybody, if you're an able person, if you're a healthy, able person, it is everybody's responsibility to go fishing. It is everybody's responsibility to let down the nets. Okay, and what I mean by that is the soul winning. Okay, going out, knocking the doors, preaching the gospel, the good news, you know, the words of eternal life, you know, something that can change an individual's eternal destiny It's all our responsibility, okay? And if we as a church have people that are able to do this, but don't do it, then what are we doing as a church? We're not letting down all our nets, are we? We're letting down some nets, but we're not letting down all our nets, okay? And of course, look, I understand there are situations that make it difficult, you know, illnesses or or, or little babies or whatever can make it uh, challenging, But look, if you're a saved believer, if you're a saint, you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, it's your responsibility to go out there and do some fishing. All right? And uh, look, we can apply apply this to many other aspects of our life. 
You know, many aspects. You know, we should be reading our Bible every day. We should be spending time every day. And if you skip a day, guess what? There's a, that's a net that you've not let down. Okay? You can be praying. You know, you should be praying to the Lord. You know, confessing your sins. You know, following the commands that are in the Lord. Whenever we disobey, whenever we do wrong, whenever we sin, that's a net in our life that we've not let down and we've held back. Okay? And the problem there is when the Lord does come and bless us, we can't take in the full blessing that God would have wanted us to have because if we only have a few nets down, our nets can break. Okay? Look at verse number 7. Luke 5, verse 7. And because their net break, it says here, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came. Hey, this is what it means. This is what's good about having good partners. Hey, if you can't go soul winning, you're like, I'm too uh, timid to talk. I'm too timid to preach the word of God. That's fine. Just be a silent partner. Hey, be a partner that can come and help the soul winner. That can come and help the preacher. They came and they helped. These were good friends. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. I mean, that's how much fish was caught on that day, that it began to sink. Hey, and and when this church building, when we've run out of seats, right, when we have enough people here, this building's going to begin to sink. And we need to find some other solution moving forward. I hope that's the case one day, all right? But, uh, you know, when we go fishing, we should share that news with our partners. We should share the blessings. Hey, you get someone saved. Hey, even if you don't get someone saved, but you had the chance to, 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 to uh, plant a seed, it's a great thing to share that amongst others, to share in the blessings that God has given you the opportunity to be a worker for Him, a fisher of men. Verse number 8, When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Hey, Simon Peter recognized his disobedience to the Lord, right? When he saw the great miracle that Christ did, all he could do was bow before Jesus Christ, confess himself a sinner, and say, depart from me. Like, you know, looking at Jesus Christ in who he is, you know, the righteous, holy Lord God, right? And he was able to do that. Hey, look, and if if there's been times in your life where you've held back some nets from the Lord, you know, you've not been obedient to the Lord, this is the same thing you need to do. You just need to bow yourself before Christ and say, look, I'm a sinner. Forgive me, I've done wrong. Okay? And do better next time. Verse number 9. For he was astonished. Why was Peter astonished? And all that were with him at the draft of the fishers that they had taken. And so was also uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, which were partakers with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. Okay? Fear not. Don't be afraid. You'll do better next time. In fact, instead of catching fishers, you're going to go and catch men. You're going to be a soul winner. You're going to catch the souls of men for the kingdom of God. God Jesus Christ uses this illustration you know, of catching the fish and, and aligning that with being a soul winner. And I love how they respond in verse 11. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. They forsook all and followed him. Now, let me just say a couple of things here. They forsook their livelihoods. They forsook their jobs. They forsook their jobs as fishermen. All right? As, I mean, did they fish other times? They probably did. Okay? But as far as a day-to-day job, they forsook that. Okay? Now, what I will say this, though, is that it is not a call to everybody to just forsake all your jobs, like you've got a family and kids, right? And, and then you've got, a, you've got a job and you're like, well, look at this, I want to follow Jesus Christ. So I'm just going to quit my job and serve him 100%. That's not a call for everybody, okay? In this part of the ministry of Jesus Christ, you know, he was going to teach his disciples and he needed them on board. It's only three years of his ministry. It's a short time that Jesus Christ was there to teach them And they could have made the decision, do I keep working my job or do I follow after Christ and become a fisher of men? And and they, you know, thank God, they made that decision to follow after Christ. Now, 
look, if your church, you know, if, you're, if, the, if the ministry you're going into is able to provide for you and for your family, that's one thing. You know, then, yeah, of course, you know, quit your job and, and, and serve the Lord in your church or what, what have you. But I have come across people, believers, and they're just like, well, you know, they're not liking their job for whatever reason. It's like, well, I'm just going to quit my job and just serve the Lord and He'll provide for me. Look, you know the Bible says that as men we are to work, to earn an income, to provide for our family, to make sure their needs are met. That is a commandment of God. This is clearly taught in the Bible. So if you're doing that, what are you doing? You're following Jesus. Look, you don't need to quit your jobs to just follow Jesus Christ. You can do, you can follow Christ in all aspects of your life. And I've covered this before, but you could be working a job you don't even like. But as long as your mindset is that I'm serving the Lord Jesus Christ and you work hard and you work for Him, then you are following Christ. You are serving Christ. Okay? So please don't have a mindset that God only wants people that are in full-time ministry. Okay? That's not the case. God wants all of us to follow after Him. Okay? Even if it's not full-time ministry that you're involved in. Verse number 12. And it came to pass, when he was in a certain city, behold, a man full of leprosy, who seeing Jesus fell on his face and besought him. So this man is sick with leprosy. He comes and he searches for Christ. He's been looking for Christ, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Hey, we see that this man had his faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. He had no doubts that Christ could have healed him from the leprosy. All right? This man had faith to begin with. Verse 13, And he put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will. Be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. And he charged him to tell no man, but go and show thyself to the priests and offer for thy cleansing, according as Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. I was going to go through Leviticus 13, but I won't do that because I've got a lot to cover here. But if you're interested into, as to what Christ is asking this man to do, then go home and read Leviticus 13 on your own. But I do want to bring this, uh, this uh, note, though, to, to your attention. So if someone was concerned about having leprosy, maybe, maybe not, they were required to go to the priest. And the priest was to assess and determine whether that person was unclean or clean. Okay. Now, this is a practice of the Old Testament. This proves to us that as Jesus Christ, and this is important for later in the chapter, so keep this in mind. As Jesus Christ was serving in his ministry, the New Testament had not yet started. Yes, Jesus Christ was teaching New Testament truths. Absolutely. Right. And, and, and the writings that, uh, you know, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and, and John, they were written once the New Testament had started, yes. But as Christ was on the earth, the Old Testament was still in effect. And Christ, who was to fulfill the whole law, was asking this man to keep the commandments of Moses, to go to the priest and show himself to be clean. All right? Now, it's interesting in verse 14, he says, And he charged him to tell no man. Hey, don't go around and tell people, that it was me that cleansed, that healed you, okay? And uh, you, might, you might say, well, that's a bit weird. Why is he saying that? Don't, don't, doesn't Jesus want everybody to come to him? And yes, he does. He does, all right? But we'll, we'll see in this chapter that Jesus Christ was already overwhelmed with the amount of people that were coming to him. That's why it starts off that the people were pressing into him, okay? And of course, Jesus would eventually go, you know, his goal was to go town to town, city by city, and even with his apostles, he sent them out in places that he could not go, or even in places to prepare for his coming. And so, yes, we see that it was the heart of Jesus to ensure that um, everybody knew about him, but it was in his time. If everyone came rushing, then there'd be people that would be uh, missed out um, on, on Jesus Christ. But look at verse 15, Luke, Luke 5, 15. Even though Jesus Christ tries to stop you know, his popularity. It says in verse 15, And so much the more went there a fame abroad of him. Because, look, there are thousands of people coming to him. 
You think they're all keeping their mouths quiet? No. Right? They're excited. They're telling people of Jesus Christ. And look, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. All right? So even though Jesus tried to prevent the excessive news uh, about his fame, it still, it still came. The, the, the fame was still spreading all over the place. And Christ was being overworked. Great multitudes were coming to be healed. All right? Now, look at verse 16. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Look, even Jesus Christ needed to take a break. Even he needed to stop for a while. But look, he still healed these people. He still made himself available to the multitudes. But there came a time even Jesus Christ in his flesh grew weary, put himself aside into the wilderness, away from all the noise, away. And for us, you know, it's, it's away from, from Facebook. You know, it's, it's away from, from the noise and the hustle bustle life. Sometimes we just need to get away somewhere quiet. You know, we all need to find a place of wilderness that we can go and just be alone with the Lord God. You know, it might be the first thing in the morning before your children wake up. Just a place of quiet. We can just bow your head and go before the Lord and pray. And we see that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Remember, He left us His steps that we can follow after Him. Even Jesus Christ needed to recharge His batteries, okay? And then get back into the work. Verse 17. Verse 17. And it came to pass on a certain day, as He was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken with a palsy. That's like cerebral uh, palsy. And they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in, because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch, sorry, yeah, with his couch, into the midst before Jesus. So we have this group of friends bringing their friend who, who can't walk and they can't come through the front door because of the multitude that are trying to hear the Lord Jesus Christ. So they go to the roof, they take down the tiles and they let him down in the roof. You know, could you imagine if this place was packed out and people wanted to come and hear the word of the Lord and all of a sudden we see the, the roof open up, right? The, the elements coming down, you know, the building material falling down, I suppose. And this man being brought down, you know, just to hear the word of the Lord, right? I mean, and uh, look at verse 20. And I, this is the memory verse. And I want you to memorize this for a reason. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. I want you to understand this. What is it? If we want our sins forgiven, if we want to be made right with the Lord, what do we need to have first? Faith. Okay? It's not that your sins are forgiven and then you have faith in the Lord. No, it's always faith first. Just like the man of leprosy, he came seeking the Lord. He had faith that the Lord Jesus Christ could heal him. And so he did. All right? And we see here before Jesus Christ even bothers healing this man of his sickness. He realizes this man has sins, but he sees the faith of the man and he sees the faith of his friends. He says, when he saw their faith, right? He said unto him, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Hey, look, the only thing that's going to cause you to be forgiven of your sins, the only thing that's going to cause you to be right before the Lord and have eternal life is for you to place your faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Your faith 100% on the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, it's my opinion, it's not clearly spelt out in the Bible, but I, I could make a study of this and prove this uh, quite strongly. But it's my opinion that Jesus Christ, when he, when he went healing people with sicknesses, it was people that had faith on him, that had already uh, placed 100% their faith on Christ, not faith that he could just heal them, but faith in who he was, the Christ, the Son of God. The only exception to this that I can see in the Bible are those that were um, possessed by devils or possessed by unclean spirits. Okay, So Christ would cast out the devils 
and then these people would be uh, sober-minded and they'd be able to believe on him. Okay, that's the only exception that I see. But every other sort of sickness, that's your sort of your standard illnesses and diseases that are in, in the world, you know, people had their faith in him. And, I, and we could do a study. We could, sh- I could show you how many times it speaks of their faith and then healing Jesus Christ healing them. All right. Now, I believe that is that is symbolic of salvation. Okay, I believe what Jesus Christ is doing is symbolic. We're, we're all diseased with sin. We're all diseased with that. We're all deserving of hellfire. But Jesus Christ says when he looks upon our faith on him, he'd come and heal us. He'd come and forgive us of our sins. All right? Verse 21. And the scribes and Pharisees began to reason, saying... <laughs> it's interesting here in verse 21. It says they're saying these things. Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Hey, they're saying the truth, but they're not accepting the truth, right? Of course, the only one that can forgive sins is God alone. Hey, this is a great passage that proves the deity of Jesus Christ, that He is God. Yes, Christ could forgive sins because He is God, right? He is God manifest in the flesh. And the Pharisees were so close to seeing this, but they just couldn't. Put their faith on Christ himself. Look at verse 22. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, hey, how were they saying this? Were they using their mouths? No, they were just thinking this, right? It was just in their minds. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And again, Jesus Christ here proves that he's God. He's able to read their thoughts. Perceiving their thoughts, he answered it, answering and said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Verse 23. Whether it is easier to say, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, rise up and walk. So if someone came here that couldn't walk, you know, let's, I don't have the power to forgive sins, but it'd be easier for me to say, thy sins be forgiven, than to make this man walk, right? So Jesus Christ is basically saying, it's easier for that, for that, okay? So if his sins were truly forgiven, and we'll see this play out, then what, what would be harder is his ability to walk. If he's able to walk, then that proves that his sins were forgiven, if that makes sense. I'm not sure if I explained that right. Anyway, verse 24. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. So is Jesus wanting these Pharisees to be saved? Of course, right? He's trying to show them his deity. Right? And he's saying there in verse 24, that ye may know that the Son of Man have power upon earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. So what is he saying? As the Son of God, he does have the power to forgive sins, right? And he commands this man to stand up and prove that his sins were forgiven. Verse 25, and immediately he rose up before them and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. Who was he glorifying? God, right? Verse 26, And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today, (laughs) right? Christ healing them, forgiving his sins, causing him to walk. These were strange things. These were strange happenings. But this is what I love about our Lord God. This is what's wonderful about being a Christian. Is that in verse 26, it said, And they glorified God and were filled with fear. Look, look, besides God, if you have fear of something, you don't glorify in it. All right? Um, Brother Jason mentioned that he has a fear of asparagus. Meaning, he doesn't glory in asparagus. All right? Or if there's something that you glory in, you don't tend to fear that thing. But it's an amazing thing that we can have a God of the universe who's perfect, who's holy, who's without sin, and we know His anger and His wrath, and we see how it's kindled when He he casts souls into the lake of fire. That's something to fear, right? We can fear how awesome He is, how great He is, how terrible and mighty our great God is. And yet, at the same time, when you're, when, you're, when you're a believer, when you have your sins forgiven, right? when you're made a child of God at the same time, you can glorify Him. It's an amazing thing that you can do both these things. 
with the Lord God. But there's nothing else in the world that you can do this, right? Fear and glory in the two things. What am I up to? Verse 27? I think I'm up to verse 27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi. Now, this Levi, that's Matthew. Okay, it's the author of the, of the book of Matthew. It's the same guy. Um, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. Verse 28. Just like the fisherman. And he left all, rose up and followed him. Okay, so what I want to point out there, guys, is that Jesus Christ, once you're saved, once you have your faith on him, he wants us to follow after him. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're a blue collar worker like a fisherman or if you're a white collar worker like Matthew was, a tax collector working for the government, you know, behind a computer. It doesn't matter what your profession is. Oh, Matt, obviously, Matthew wasn't behind a computer, but whatever your profession is, whatever your, your place is in society, whoever you are, rich or poor, great job, poor job, doesn't matter, okay? Jesus Christ wants all of us to follow after him, okay? He is the final answer to everybody, regardless of who you are, all right? And I love how he just raises up. He probably had a, a good job, like a well-paying job, and he was willing to forsake that and seek after the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 29. And we can see that he's probably a wealthy man because look in verse 29, he says, And Levi made him a great feast in his own house, and there was a great company of publicans. So, hey, he invites his, his work colleagues, right? And if you get an opportunity... And I appreciate Brother Callum, every now and again he gives us an update on some, someone in, in his workplace that he's trying to preach the gospel to. Hey, if you have an opportunity in your workplace to t- tell them about Jesus Christ, do it! Right? We see Levi set this example. He gets his work buddies to come and hear Jesus Christ. And, uh, and of others that, that sat down with them, verse 30. But their scribes and Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Now, this is an interesting part of the Bible here. And Jesus answering said unto them, remember the Pharisees and, and, and the scribes, these ones in particular, were not believers of Jesus Christ. They were being critical of his ministry. And Jesus answering said unto them, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. All right. Verse 32, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Wow. All right, so, and it's unfortunate because when you go through the Bible, sometimes you've got, you can't just preach the truth. I mean, I'm always, hopefully I'm always preaching the truth, but sometimes you just got to stop and deal with false doctrine, okay? Because this passage here, for those that believe, you've got to turn from your sins to be saved, right? They say faith alone in Christ is insufficient. You've got to do more. You've got to keep the works of the law. You've got to turn from your sins to be saved. Those people that preach a false gospel, this is one of the verses they turn to and say, see, look, Jesus Christ came not for the righteous, but he's calling the sinners to repentance. And so they interpret this verse to say, Jesus Christ is saying to the sinners, turn from your sins to be saved. But they never explain the first bit about the righteous. All right. So let's, let's take a look at this. First of all, did Jesus Christ come seeking only some people? No. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. All. Okay? So when we look at this, when Christ says he's called sinners to repentance, is this talking about just a certain group of people? No, he's talking about all. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay? Everyone is a sinner. Otherwise, what you're saying here, if you're saying that to be saved, you must turn from sins to be saved, then what are you saying? You're saying that there are some that are righteous on their own and are saved. You understand that? They're right because Jesus says that he's not come for the righteous. So, did these people... And he's referring, obviously, to the Pharisees and the scribes in the context of this. Were the, were the Pharisees and the scribes here saved? No, they were rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So, let's understand what is Jesus talking about here. When he says, I've not come to call the righteous, 
What he's saying to the scribes and Pharisees is that they're self-righteous. Okay? They're self-righteous and they need to be like these publicans that recognize they're sinners. The only way you can be saved is to turn from your self-righteousness and recognize your condition as a sinner before the Lord. Okay? This is why when we go door to door soul winning, you know, the first things that are out of our mouth is that they're a sinner, that they're not perfect, that they've broken the law of God because the very first things that come out of the mouth is I'm a good person. God's going to allow me to heaven because I'm good. And we need to tell them, no, you're not good. There is none good, no, not one. All right? Same thing for these Pharisees. They thought they were self-righteous. All right, if you're self-righteous, you can be that way. Okay? But uh, you're not going to be saved. You need to see yourself as a sinner first. And that's why Christ was, was able to fellowship with these publicans because they were ready to recognize that about themselves and, and, uh, and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. Verse 33. And they said unto him, these are the Pharisees, why do the disciples of John fast often? I, I find this funny because the Pharisees, they didn't like John the Baptist either. But he's using a godly man to criticize, in a sense, another godly man. All right? That's what the wicked do. All right? Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers and likewise the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. So they are comparing Jesus and his disciples to the Pharisees and the disciples of the Pharisees and John the Baptist. Verse 34. And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? So, you know, a bridegroom, that's just a, the groom. We call it the groom today. When you're a groom or a bridegroom, you're given that label just before you're getting married or shortly after you're married. Okay. Now, a marriage, is that a time to fast? Is that a time to not eat bread and to go without food? No. You know, a marriage is normally followed with a reception, with some sort of marriage feast. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of rejoicing. It's a time to uh, enjoy food and enjoy fellowship with one another. And Jesus Christ says, look, you know, we know that he's only, his ministry is only for the three years that he's there. And he says, look, while I'm here with them, we're going to be feasting because it's not a time to fast. Verse 35. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them and then shall they fast in those days. All right? When was Jesus Christ taken away from them? When? It was after his death, resurrection, and ascension into heaven. All right? After the New Testament was brought in. Okay? Hebrews 9.15, you don't need to turn there. It says, And for this cause, speaking of Jesus, He is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead, Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So what is Jesus Christ saying here? He's saying, once the New Testament is in force, that's when my people are going to fast. Okay? And remember, the, the man with leprosy, Jesus Christ was operating under the Old Testament at that time. And now he's speaking about the New Testament. The New Testament, which is shortly going to come to pass. All right? And remember again, guys, the book of Luke. Keep in mind, as you study, as you read the book of Luke, Luke makes, makes, it, uh, makes an effort to keep it thematic, to keep it topical. He's not too focused on it being in, in perfect chronological order because this all adds up to the end of the chapter. The Old Testament in force, the New Testament now being spoken about when Jesus Christ will be taken away from them. And we'll start to see this toward the end of the chapter, how it all comes together. Verse 36, Luke, um, Luke 5.36. And um, let me just say, the rest of this chapter, I've never heard anybody preach on these verses. I, I just, I've been in church my whole life, Baptist Union, Independent Baptists. People just skip this. And I understand why, because I had difficulty with it as I was going through it. But I think I've, I've come to, to an answer, okay? Verse 37, uh, 36, sorry. And he spake also a parable unto them. Now, this parable 
It's, it's got three parts. I used to think it had two parts, but it's got three parts. Let's read it. No man put a piece of new garment upon an old. Now, as, the reason I was talking to you about the Old and New Testament is because I want you in your mind to be thinking about, the, when he talks about the Old and New, I want you to be thinking about the Old and the New Testament. All right? Uh, sorry, um, no man put a piece of a new garment upon an old. If otherwise, then both the new make it for rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agree if not with the old. So if my shirt, you know, let's say I've been wearing this for six months, and then it, 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 uh, there's a tear. So Christina, you know, instead of me buying a new shirt, we, we get uh, a piece of new garment, and we just patch it on there, okay? So the new garment has not been, has not been stretched like the old garment, you know, maybe it's not shrunk in the watch, uh, wash like the new garment. All right, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a much stronger fabric because the old garment has been used up a little bit, right? And so when you put a new, uh, a new garment on, it can stretch or it can uh, shrink and it can, it, it's stronger than the old garment so it can cause a tear and, and just make it worse. It's not going to be the solution. You need the new garment, put away the old garment and you need to purchase yourself a new garment. That's pretty easy to understand, verse 36. But the next verse is a bit challenging. Verse 37. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles, and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. Now, I used to think verse 39 was part of verses 37, verse 38. I, I no longer see that. Because look at how verse 39 starts. No man... Okay, now, look at verse 36 again. How does it start? And he spake a parable unto them, no man, right? Then verse 37, and no man. So there's another part. And then verse 38, verse 30, 39, no man. So you see, there are three parts to this one parable, each illustrating a very similar concept. Okay, and I think this is important to help understand what we're reading about here. Because, again, and I've got to deal with this, because, I don't, you know, I believe drinking alcohol is a sin, all right? And I've seen people use these passages to teach, hey, look, Jesus Christ is saying it's okay to drink alcohol. No. All right, let's look at this. And I think that's why a lot of people just avoid it. Because <laughs> it, it, there is a bit of a challenge, but I think if we just take it as it is, we'll be, we'll be fine. All right, now look at this. Um, let's look at verse 37 first. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. All right? So, I've got some new wine here. That's freshly squeezed grape juice. All right? Freshly squeezed, don't worry. <laughs> uh, new wine. Now, when the Bible talks about new wine, it's always freshly squeezed uh, grape juice. Fresh, non-alcoholic grape juice. All right? Now, when you crush grapes, there's a film of yeast on the, on, on, on the skin of the grapes, and as soon as you crush them, even though you don't, you don't notice it with your eye, it starts to ferment. Immediately, the yeast starts to eat away the sugars of the grape juice. And um, in time, once the sugars are all used up, it becomes alcoholic. Okay? Now, when fermentation takes place, it releases, um, you know, it starts to carbonate, it releases carbon, and it starts to expand. You know? And I'll give you an example of this. If you've ever purchased fruit juice, like in a normal plastic container, if you've ever left it out for a few days or it's been in the fridge for too long, sometimes you'll, you'll notice that the, the, the um, or, or even milk. Have you ever finished milk, drinking milk, and then you've closed it and you've left it and the bottle just starts to expand? There's fermentation taking place during that time. It starts to expand. And what I've learned about um, the Old Testament uh, bottles, now, I don't think they were using glass bottles, but a lot of people suggest they were using leather bottles. And that would make some sort of sense, okay? Make a, make a bit of sense. Because if those leather bottles and leather can be stretched, all right, that when, when fermentation takes place, that the leather bottle would be expanded, okay? And then it, it'll weaken. So you wouldn't put new fresh grape juice into that already expanded bottle because as it continues, as the new wine ferments, you know, it'll, it'll burst those, those uh, skins. And then it'll be, you know, you waste the bottle and you'll waste the juice, all right? The point I want to say here is, guys, is that as soon as you crush the grapes, fermentation starts to take place. Okay, there's already expansion. It doesn't have to become alcoholic for it to be, uh, uh, for fermentation to be taking place. Now, I was, I was looking this up a little bit. 
If you took normal grape juice and just left it, crushed the grapes, you didn't add any sugar, you didn't add any yeast to it, it takes about a week or two before it becomes alcoholic wine. But even then, the alcohol content is not as, as high as the breweries because the breweries add sugars, add yeast, and make the alcohol content even higher. All right? So let's understand this. Um, so what Christ is saying here, what Christ is saying is that um, once the New Testament is in place, okay, then his disciples will fast, and you cannot go back into, you can't put the Old Testament upon you, okay, back upon you. Now, if you, if you read the book of Acts, or even the epistles, you, you'll recognize that there are certain Jews that aren't happy with how the Gentiles, you know, were saved by faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're saying, look, they, they need to get circumcised, right? You know, they're, they're taking Old Testament principles and trying to apply that to the New Testament, right? And that's wrong. You know, they, they were called out for that because Old Testament circumcision was a picture of circumcision in the heart that, that takes place both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, okay? You can't take things that are, that are necessarily physical, that were required personally for the nation of Israel, and then apply that and force that upon New Testament believers. Amen. No, God had a, had a system for Old Testament Israel, the nation of Israel, okay? And a lot of what they did was symbolic of truths of the Bible, all right? So we need to be mindful when we, when, as we're in New Testament times that we're not going and sacrificing animals, you know, that we're not forcing people to go and get circumcised, right? Because these things are no longer in place. Jesus Christ came and fulfilled the law of God. Now, I'm not saying the Old Testament, you throw out the Old Testament. No, there is great truth. You know, the New Testament is built on the Old Testament, okay? Many of the things that we see in the New Testament just point us back to the Old Testament. There's a lot of things to learn there. You know, you should know it all. I'm not saying that. But you can't enforce the things that God put upon Israel and the law of Moses upon the New Testament saints, you know? And this is where people start to corrupt the gospel as well. We won't go into that right now. All right. Now... Let's understand verse 39. Well, actually, one more thing, one more thing. Because um, I've heard people that, that promote alcohol say this. Well, they must have been drinking alcoholic beverages back then if this, uh, this expansion was taking place. Now, I looked this up, but there's a process called pasteurization. If you've gone to high school or school, primary school, you probably learned this, okay? It's a process that came, I think it was the 1880s, uh, by a guy called something Pasteur. It's named after him where in order to preserve, say, milk or to preserve fruit juice, they found, because, you know, there's microorganisms all over, like in the air, you know, all the time. You, you've, you've got bacteria in your body all the time. You've probably even got parasites and things like that. And so when you open, um, you know, juice or milk, stuff that's in the air will, will go into, the, into the, the juice and spoil it, okay? Now, in order to uh, prevent, to, to preserve uh, juice or milk, whatever, what they found is that you could boil or, or heat up um, the juice, heat up the milk to kill all the yeast and to kill all the bacteria and then you, you seal it airtight so there's no other microorganisms that go in it and that will preserve the drink longer. In fact, I called the, the vineyard that made this and I said, how long does this last as it is? They said easily two years, easily and probably beyond that. They just don't guarantee the quality after two years, okay? Because it's been pasteurized. It was heat up. It's been sealed tight, uh, airtight, and, uh, and it, it'll last, okay? And so this cannot become on its own, unless you, you go and add yeast to it or something. This cannot become alcoholic. Now, people say, well, see, pasteurization only came in the 1800s. Look, yes, modern pasteurization came in the 1800s. Yes, I, I recognize that, all right? But do you honestly... Do you honestly want to tell me that for the thousands of years, and I believe the people back then were smarter than us, right? Are you going to tell me they could not figure out to just boil juice or boil milk for it to last longer? Right? And I looked this up, and yeah, sure enough, there's documents and evidence that different societies throughout the world, even before pasteurization, were doing the same process, heating things up so it would kill the bacteria and it would be preserved longer. My point is... The juice that's in these bottles may very well just be pasteurized grape juice and never intended for it to become alcoholic. But you know what? Even if I open this bottle up right now, 
and I left it open for a little while and then closed it and, and, expel, and you know, um, allowed the elements to sort of fall into it, this will be start to become, this will start to ferment. Okay? There'd be certain bacteria that would come in here, start eating away the sugar, and it'll start to expand and it starts to spoil. Okay? But that doesn't mean it's going to become alcoholic. It just means it's going to ferment, it's going to, uh, uh, all the sugar is going to be used up, and it's, it's not going to be nice at all. It's not going to be good to drink. And so my point is, even with, uh, with the example of pasteurization, the expansion of the bottles does not necessarily mean it's alcoholic. It doesn't have to mean that. But obviously those that want to teach that alcohol is fine will find a way, you know, any scriptures they can, to put that in there and say, see, Jesus Christ is, you know, promoting alcohol here. That's not the case. Okay, it's not the case. You're really drawing a long bow there, especially when you know the rest of the Bible, what it teaches on this topic. Okay, but I wanted to give you an answer to that, just in case, you know, that's, that's on your mind. Let's end with verse 39. Verse 39, the third part of this parable. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith the old is better. And again, the alcoholics will say, see, here's a man drinking old wine, and by that they mean um, alcoholic wine, okay, that they would prefer to drink that alcoholic wine than to drink fresh grape juice. Well, here's my question to that. If someone loves their alcohol, okay, loves alcoholic wine, if that's how you interpret it, why would he ever desire new wine? Think about that. Because the new wine is freshly squeezed grape juice. That's non-alcoholic. Why would the, the, the drunkard ever desire the freshly squeezed grape juice? It's not the case. It can't happen, right? Because he always wants the old. He always wants the old. He's never going to want the new. All right? Now, what Jesus Christ is saying here, no man also having drunk old wine, old wine straightway desireth the new. So eventually, he will desire the new. So is this talking about an alcoholic, you know, wanting fresh grape juice at some point? No. It's just that um, he's been, you know, we, we understand that the concept of the bottle's breaking. Obviously, he's going to finish what he has before he opens the new. You know, why is he going to open the new wine and cause that to ferment, for that to spoil, Okay, and then you're going to have problems on both ends. You haven't finished the old wine. It's, it's going to burst, you know, it's, it's going to uh, uh, spoil. And then you open the new wine and it's going to ferment. You'd create two problems if that's the case. What I believe this is teaching is that he's going to finish his old drink. So let's say this was open halfway through. I'm going to finish what I started before I open up the new bottle. Okay, that's what's happening. And so what Jesus Christ is teaching here is that we're wait at this point in time, they were waiting for the Old Testament to pass away so that the New Testament could come into fruition. All right? Hebrews 8.13 says this, In that he saith, A new covenant, he have made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Okay, the Old Testament, there was, there was a time for it to vanish away, and today it's definitely gone. Okay, and now the New Testament is in effect with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he's teaching. Okay, and this is what the Pharisees needed to understand in their mind. Okay, is you need to get to a point now where you're moving away from the Old Testament and you start receiving Jesus Christ, the testator of the New Testament. All right, let's leave it there. Let's pray.